to everyone joining us today and to our guests on this discussion panel, Dr. Karen Mack and Professor Helen Chatterjee. Now, as Victoria says, creativity and wellbeing this year is focusing on how creativity can help in a health crisis. Only it's not really just one crisis that we're referring to, but multiple unfolding crises. The overstretched and underfunded National Health Service, the still fresh and yet now hardly acknowledged legacy of the COVID-19 pandemic, the failure to invest in social care, and the biggest untackled health crisis of all, the climate emergency. Now, we also know that all of these crises affect people unequally, exacerbating existing inequalities and fostering division. And the arts can't possibly solve all of this. And also, since culture is a product and a mirror of society, it can often widen those gaps too if we're not careful. But whilst acknowledging this complexity, we also know that creative and cultural workers have always had a special place in helping to shine a light on challenges and drive change in at least three ways. Firstly, by giving voice to experiences of health and crises that might otherwise be hidden. Secondly, to build up communities to take on the challenges they face. And thirdly, to help us all imagine a better world by creating joy in the heart of difficulty. So what about the role of research in helping us to understand all this? And specifically, what might current and recent research reveal about the role and impact of creativity in a health crisis? Well, there are, of course, lots of ways to approach those questions. And today we'll be thinking about this at both the general population level. So how arts and culture can help all of us to lead happier and healthier lives not just in times of personal crisis, but also community crisis or even global crises, but also exploring whether and how creativity helps those individuals who are most in need and experiencing disadvantage. So to have a great conversation about that today, I'm delighted to be joined by two amazing researchers. Firstly, Professor Helen Chatterjee, who is a professor of human and ecological health at University College London and a programme director for UCL's Masters in Creative Health. Helen also uh, is also currently Research Programme Director for Health Inequalities within the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and she sits on the Board of Trustees for the National Centre for Creative Health. She's also been involved in the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance since our, uh, since our inception, has been an amazing supporter of this work. So welcome, Helen. And secondly, Dr. Karen Mack is a Senior Research Fellow in Epidemiology and Statistics in the Department of Behavioural Science and Health at University College London. Her group, which is led by Dr. Daisy Fancourt, is the World Health Organization's Collaborating Centre for Arts and Health, and their research focuses on the association between arts and cultural community engagement and well-being using, using nationally representative data and cohort studies. Now, that group also ran the COVID-19 social study, which was the largest study of people's psychological and social experiences during the pandemic with over 70,000 participants. So I'm delighted to welcome Karen today. So with, without further ado, I'm going to dive right into our discussion and we're hoping to keep this relatively informal. I've got some questions to ask Helen and Karen and, um, and hopefully, you know, a nice conversation will ensue. So I will go on to our first question, which I'm going to first direct to Helen, and that is, what do you feel your research is telling us about creativity in a health crisis? Thanks, Rosie, and thank you for the lovely introduction. It's great to be here. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Helen Chatterjee. I'm a mixed race, middle aged woman uh, with mid length dark hair and uh, black rimmed spectacles. So very nice to meet you all and looking forward to the discussion. Wow, well, it's a big question, isn't it? And um, I guess my starting point is thinking about some of those major issues that affect society. I'm going to think in particular about the UK, but I think these are really global problems. So if we just look at the UK, 89% of deaths in the UK are attributable to what we call non-communicable diseases. That includes everything from coronary heart disease, stroke, um, cancer, diabetes and other obesity related uh, illnesses. But we know that very large numbers of those deaths could be prevented, avoided or delayed um, if we dealt with the causes of those diseases. So at the minute, what we're doing is throwing huge sums of money to treat the symptoms of these diseases. Um, and I think that's where arts and creativity and community engagement can really play a role. Um, 
we the program that I'm working on with UK Research and Innovation at the minute is really focused on that question of how can we think about getting more engagement within communities, because we know that people who are more engaged in their communities, that are more active in their communities, that have better access to services, resources, assets, organisations, arts, creativity, green space, are healthier. But we also know that there are huge disparities across the country. And I always talk about Blackpool because I'm from Blackpool, one of the most deprived areas of the country. There are many, many other areas like Blackpool that have some of the highest levels of deprivation um, and uh, housing people who are experiencing the worst inequalities in society. And we're seeing there, of course, these huge differences in life expectancy, sometimes up to 15 years life difference in terms of people who live in a much less deprived area can people, compared to people who live in the most deprived areas. So we know we've got all of these unfair and uneven distribution of services and access to services, including things like arts, creativity, access to quality green space. So what we're interested in is how could we make that better for the people who need it most? And I can put a link in the chat to the programme that we'll be that we're working on at the minute. Um, but I think that's where we can really think about the role of arts and creativity, is how can we reduce that gap? How can we improve access for the people who need it most? How can we have a more targeted approach for those people? And I think the sorts of work that goes on within these sorts of research programs. I've been working with these guys at UK Research and Innovation for about four years, co-developing this program with organizations like the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, with the Lived Experience Network, colleagues at NHS Personalized Care, across social prescribing, designing this program. But these sorts of programs of research, and um, I'm gonna hand over in a minute to Karen, and she can tell you a little bit more about some of the details of the sorts of research an evidence base that we have around engagement between arts, creativity and health and well-being. So we know that it works. So it's how can we change the system to make it better for the people who need it most? So maybe now is a good time, Karen, for you to tell people about some of that research. Thank you, Helen. Um, so my name is Karen. Um, I'm Chinese. I'm in my early 30s with long dark hair and glasses. Um, so uh, the questions about how do I feel about my research is telling us about creativity in a health crisis. Now, I would like to say um, to kind of like look at the health crisis in terms of that it is a broad term that involves health inequalities across social backgrounds or geographical regions. And we might also be experiencing a health crisis that is attributed to population aging, particularly in the UK, where one in five of the adult population is people who are aged 65 and above. And so with the increasing population aging will come with increases in depression, loneliness and cognitive decline and other health issues. And so in our team, what we're trying to understand is whether um, the arts is associated with health and different types of health, including mental, physical, um, social, and behavioral, using population survey data. So there are a couple of themes that come out consistently from our research in the past five years, and I wanted to highlight them, um, and I would like to share with you today now. Um, so the first one is that uh, we're using this population survey data, which consists hundreds and thousands of variables, um, we are able to factor in people's social demographic backgrounds while testing the relationship between arts and health. And what we found is that arts are not a proxy of people's resources and their social demographic backgrounds, and that the arts can provide additional health benefits that our social backgrounds do not provide. And I think it's very important to stress this out because oftentimes when we look at the relationship between arts and health, we often would think like, oh, is that because people who have more resources they engage in the arts and therefore they are healthier? But what we found in our research consistently is that it's not that this is not the case. In fact, arts can provide things that our social backgrounds do not provide. Um, and that links to our second theme that emerged from our research is that um, arts, is that the health benefits of the arts are universal regardless of where we live and regardless of um, where social background we're from. 
So to give you an example, we have worked on a, um, a study that used multiple different data sources that link population survey data with participants' household postcode directory um, from the Office of National Statistics, which provides neighborhood characteristics of what it looks like for the participants uh, where they live. And what we found is that um, it, for people who engage in um, cultural and creative engage activities, they show um, that they can receive the mental health benefits regardless of um, the places that they live. And so including like across different um, places, across with different area deprivation levels. So what we also found is that um, the mm. health benefits of the arts and creativity may actually be stronger amongst people living in more deprived areas. Um, and I think this is really important to understand that because um, this is basically saying that, as, as Helen mentioned, if we can address the inequalities in engagement, then maybe everybody will then have an equal opportunity to engage, uh, to, to improve their health and well-being through equality, uh, participants' engagement. Um, so in other pieces of research that we have also looked into is to understand what exactly it is in the arts that um, contributes to health and well-being and what we define it as active ingredients. So things like creativity and social interactions. So engaging in the arts not only improve health, but, but also the social elements or um, the creativity elements within the activity that can also improve that that also improve the uh, improve our health and well-being, and finally, um, our research also look into and identify different mechanisms that links the arts to our health and well-being. So really, to understand how the arts is connected to health. And we have four different mechanisms, including biological, social, psychological, and behavioral mechanisms, and which really explains not only that art is associated with health, but why the arts are also related to health. Um, so I will put on, I think um, Victoria may share the link later about more details um, regarding um, active ingredients and mechanisms. Wow, amazing. Thanks, Karen. Is it? You did such a good job then of just doing a really good whistle stop tour of that very big picture stuff. It's very impressive. Thank you. Um, before we move on, I was really interested in what you said about kind of who who is getting who gets the most benefits from the arts, particularly people living in deprived areas. And, and we will go on to kind of make that the focus of, of our second um, bit of the discussion. But before we do that. I want to reflect on something you just said, Helen, about non-communicable diseases and that kind of prevention angle as well. Um, are there any, in your view, any particular sort of crises we're facing at the moment, particular health crises, say mental health or a particular physical health condition, where you feel the evidence base is particularly strong for investing in arts and creativity, either as a prevention or as a treatment mechanism? Yeah, really good point. I, I mean, definitely around the psychosocial benefits. So Karen talked about you know, those psychological, but also behavioural. And one of the biggest challenges around the evidence base is we've got so much brilliant evidence about those kind of short term benefits of engaging, you know, a lot of programmes due to the many limitations that I'm sure many people are, are familiar with here in terms of funding and the short term nature of funding. We've got brilliant evidence base about those short and medium term impacts. And then if you think then of those wider population benefits that Karen just talked about, the opportunity to, to stay involved in art, creativity, community based activities, that's where the preventative and that's where the behavioural changes come in. So I think it's how we can shift from this kind of short term model where we know we get brilliant benefits. So, yes, I would say around the psychological and the social, but also I think one of the other benefits around arts and creativity is that they're very multi-sensory, they're multifaceted. So we actually, as Karen talked about those mechanisms, it's really important to think about that in terms of what goes on inside an activity, inside a programme, because there is some brilliant arts and creativity that goes on that supports those assets around mental health, staying healthy, overcoming trauma, et cetera. We've got brilliant evidence around that. But I think there's also increasing evidence of that idea of 
staying actively involved in arts and creativity and community. And that's where we get into prevention and things like behavior change, lifestyle changes. And we're starting to see some brilliant evidence coming out around that. And that's where we can then hope to experience those wider population benefits, but not, I think, until we address some of those barriers, which is, I know where you want to take us next. I do, and thank you. And, and obviously then if we want these to be, you know, if we want this all to be habit forming, so we are all kind of engaging in creativity on a regular basis throughout our lives, then of course the crucial thing there is us having the opportunity to do so where we live as well. And I know, Karen, some of your research has looked at kind of geographic differences between um, who's engaging and who's not. But in your view, what do you feel are the biggest barriers that we're facing that are stopping us better using creativity to tackle some of, and prevent some of these health crises? Oh, so um, I'm not sure the biggest barriers, but I am sure that there are different levels and different layers of barriers that might contribute to it. Um, so um, to summarize, um, I think there are three layers of barriers. The first layer is individual barriers. So like our social backgrounds and resources, childhood exposure to the arts, whether or not we have the artistic abilities to doing to engage in the arts, social opportunities. So like whether we have friends to engage with the arts with and also our motivations and preferences. And these are the best, some of the barriers, some of the individual barriers are hard to change. For example, social backgrounds. But others, such as motivation and preferences or social opportunities, may be more modifiable that we can we might be able to overcome and change. Now, the second layer of barriers would be related to community and neighborhoods. Um, we can understand the, these barriers through the lens of cultural deserts, which is a theory that was originated from the food desert from health geography, which proposes that if we have enough arts venues and um, events and programs within our neighborhoods, if people living in those neighborhoods are able to afford doing the activities, and if it is as it is easy to access to those activities, so like with great transport link, and if with safe um, neighborhood environments, then maybe we can encourage people to engage in the arts more often. And final layer, which is the larger upper, the upper layer, would be the national barriers, which would be related to policy, um, norms and values on leisure activities, government resources and investment, and perhaps inequalities as well. And I think all these different like, layers of barriers would then shape how likely uh, we engage in the earth on a population level. What's your take on this, Helen? Yeah, I mean, and just to pick it, absolutely agree. And, and picking up Karen's last point there, I think some of those barriers are, are really tricky, particularly at that kind of, you know, national policy level and, and the sorts of work that's going on in the Mobilising Community Assets Programme that I talked about and that we put a link to in the chat is really trying to address some of those, what we might really refer to as system-based problems. You know, we're dealing with really entrenched systems that have been you know, in play since, you know, the 1940s, 1950s, when the NHS came in, um, and they're, you know, they've evolved over time to really focus in on those dealing with the symptoms. We've just seen the announcement around the public health fund, uh, uh, spend and the disparities that arise around that. For example, some of the poorest areas in the UK, in England, had some of the worst cuts around their public health spend. And yet those are the communities where we really should be investing in public health prevention and intervention strategies that work for the poorest people. But we're not, you know, again, Blackpool had some of the worst public health spend cuts um, in this tranche and this round of funding from the government. So we've got some really big challenges around those health systems changed. Um, there are, I think, opportunities around, for example, the introduction of the integrated care systems. Those are, of course, being rolled out across England, have already been in play across the devolved nations. There is a big emphasis there on integration, particularly with the communities, voluntary, faith sector. Um, but I think it's really hard, particularly for small organisations. Many of our audience may be from some of those, those organisations, maybe freelancers. I think it's really hard for those organisations to think about collaboration and commissioning with those sorts of partners. Um, 
So those are the sorts of models that I think we need to change. That's what we're trying to look at in the grant program I mentioned. And I think there's a huge appetite, certainly that the projects that we've invested in, it's a 30 million pound spend and we've funded projects all over the UK. Um, some of the sorts of uh, work that those guys are doing, looking really at systems working, how community organisations are working with different kinds of health, social care and local authority partners, understanding exactly this question, what some of those barriers are, is that there are really significant opportunities for collaboration, particularly for smaller organisations to work together, so they're not competing for the same small pots of money, that they're also thinking about how by working together, they could be tackling these kind of wider social determinants of health, which of course is really what some of those bigger challenges are. It's, it's what drives poverty is, you know, where people live, what their access to those services is, what their access to quality education is, um, their economic status, the housing that we live in. We're starting to hear more and more about that and, and the inequalities that exist amongst housing stock and simply how living in very, very poor quality housing has such a significant effect. Your access to, for example, work. Um, so, of course, whilst the arts can't directly address those, indirectly it can, actually, and we see brilliant examples of that through individuals gaining confidence, gaining skills, gaining that network, gaining confidence, uh, getting back into work, for example. We can see real drivers also changing those sorts of lifestyles and behavioural things that Karen was talking about. But it's, it's it, making those opportunities available, I think, to, in that really targeted way, and again, what we need to see is that more targeted approach to how we can right down to that kind of neighborhoods postcode level make those sorts of services and resources available to more people and you know there's brilliant organizations and some of them are here today i know that are doing that really detailed work in communities and really have a deep understanding of what inequalities are but that's often not what gets commissioned and that's often not the sorts of understanding that for example commissioners or referrers or funders have and that's what we need to integrate. We need to integrate that kind of population level understanding of what's going on in terms of inequalities and health trajectories alongside that really in-depth, important communities knowledge, which I think is the best route to tackling that. Absolutely. And it makes me think of a phrase that Michael Marmot uses, which is targeted universalism, isn't it? Yeah. Which, is, which, is, which is the idea that everybody should have access to, say, arts and culture for their health and well-being. But that if you just leave that to kind of the market or leave it to itself, then what's going to happen is that the people who already have the most are going to have the most access. So you need to do something to shift that balance and that and to target that work um, and those projects on the people that perhaps don't have enough access to begin with or who are most affected by inequalities. Um, so it's really great to hear about some of the work in mobilising community assets for health inequalities that you're doing, Helen. Um, but I've got a, a quick question to ask to Karen, which is, which is from what you've seen in your research, Karen, whose role do you think it is to be addressing some of these barriers? You know, you've seen quite stark differences across lots of different areas, um, say socioeconomics, um, gender, geography, all those kinds of things. You know, who's, whose role is it to be thinking about how we overcome some of those barriers and close some of those gaps? That's a really good question. Um, I think the role should be shared with different levels um, of people across different sectors. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because um, the types of inequalities in terms of like engaging in the arts means that different people are likely to face different types of challenges to engage in the arts. And so one size fits all approach is not going to work at all. So we need to make sure that um, to, to come up with a um, proposal or a model that fits particularly for a targeted group of people um, and in order to make sure that um, and, and, and really to understand how to attract people with, from different diverse um, demographic groups um, in order to ensure that to diversify the um, arts audience and also reduce inequalities and engagements. Um, but one thing that I do think is really important is the school provision of the arts. And the reason why I'm saying that is because childhood cultural behavior is a very strong predictor of whether or not we continue to engage in the art in the future. 
And in most activities, actually, there are more children engagement, engaging with school, engaging with the arts in school than outside of school, or a combination of both school-based and out-of-school engagement. And so schools can really remove um, barriers by providing children opportunities to be exposed to different types of the arts, while at the same time upskilling their artistic abilities to engage. So they feel confident, they feel more um, motivated to continue to engage in the future. So schools that create, can create that kind of culture of motivation, which you've said is very important and forming those habits, which then will lay, lay that groundwork for people to be engaged throughout their lives in, in culture and creativity. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, particularly, we have a uh, research uh, find that when we try to compare the predictors that predict children's engagement in the arts in school versus out of school, we found that there is a social gradient when children engage in out of school, where if their parents engage in the arts or take them to go to museums or heritage sites or engage in the arts activities, they're much more likely to engage. Um, but we don't see this pattern if children engage with school, um, which, is, which makes sense because in schools, most of them are compulsory and mandatory. And so we wouldn't see the social gradient as, as, as such as big as engaging outside of school. Very interesting. So we've already started to think about what we can do as a society to overcome some of these barriers to um, to do things differently to support people to Im improve access to culture for their health and well-being. Um, but Helen, I'm, I've got a question for you, which is what sorts of partnerships and collaborations do we need to form to tackle some of these barriers? You know, what what kinds of partnerships are you seeing in your in your program at uh, UKRI? Yeah, I think the key thing is about that collaboration across different types of activities and services and that sort of co-location. And we're seeing really exciting examples of that. And I can put a link to one example that speaks really nicely to Karen's point um, about the importance of embedding this in early years in schools. And it's that idea of, I guess, thinking in the back of your mind always about those wider social determinants of health. So there's the health stuff, the physical side, physiological, biological, and the psychological. But then those big things that like we've just talked about that really affect people, their economic status, where they live, are, where they're born, uh, where they age and where they die, really has such a huge difference. So their access to services. So if we can start thinking about things like simply access to things like social welfare, legal advice is really, really, there's loads of disparities around that. Issues around access to food, we know, are huge and increasing, of course. So we're starting to see really exciting examples of, you know, museums, libraries, art centres working, say, with food banks, with free social welfare legal advisors, um, particularly around lots of fantastic collaboration around arts and nature and thinking about those wider environmental issues, about the quality of the environment that you live in. Again, some of the poorest areas, the most deprived areas in the country, they have some of the worst air pollution, for example. So all of these things, of course, play a role. And uh, maybe Victoria can put in the chat that Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance have already done some really nice work on this idea of how you might link up to think about arts and creativity and how that relates to things like um, climate change, thinking about sustainability, thinking about pro-environmental behaviours. Um, and we're, we're in fact, uh, uh, Victoria and I have got a, a student from our Masters in Creative Health working on some continued work around uh, that opportunity that presents itself, I think, to link up across arts, creativity, nature, climate change, thinking about those wider kind of environmental crises, because they affect all of us. How could that link in to, for example, growing food, understanding more what that means in terms of diet and healthy eating, which again is a privilege to know about that sort of intel, you know, uh, along with removing arts and creativity from the curriculum, access to the outdoors, access to uh, physical exercise has also been really removed from the curriculum. So we're raising our young people to not have any awareness around these bigger public health and environmental issues. Um, and then telling them off that they've not been living healthy enough and are then costing loads of money in the health service. So it's really the wrong way around. So it's that idea um, of how we can join up services and how we could link up our expertise. So we'd love to get 
people's insights if you're running exciting programs or opportunities around that linking up with different kinds of services whether it's around green space and thinking about climate change or food growing for example we'd love to hear from you our student is called Ailsa and uh, Victoria is going to put a link into the survey that we're doing I know you've surveyed out but it's really just a chance for her to find out a little bit about what you're doing and then maybe have a chat with you about some of the work that you might be doing so please share that with us but I think for us, it really is around that co-location of services. And there's increasing interest in that from funders, uh, at that idea of what we're calling collaborative commissioning or alliance commissioning, uh, which there's a, a lot of interest in, particularly at the health, in terms of health spend, but also other types of funders like lottery, et cetera, who I think are interested in this idea of rather than funding lots and lots of smaller scale projects, thinking about this idea of collaboration and, and funding larger scale collaboration. Yeah, I think that's that's really inspiring. Thanks, Helen. I think sometimes, though, what I do feel is that all of this can be very overwhelming sometimes, can't it? Especially for sort of freelance artists. And I think yeah. about those people a lot thinking, gosh, they're looking into this into this huge thing. And sometimes, you know, one of the challenges that gets leveled at initiatives like social prescribing is that, well, we're, we're just here at the grassroots level and you're, you know, there's there's perhaps a perceived expectation, whether it's real or not, that artists are, are supposed to take all of this on and, uh, you know, and and somehow come up with a way of like solving some of these big big challenges or so, or forming some of these big partnerships on their own, um, which I feel sometimes can be that's a big ask, isn't it? It isn't is, it? and I, you know, I think that we've got the new posts that have come in play from funded from Arts Council through the National Centre for Creative Health, the Creative Health Associate Post. That's exactly the role that we are hoping that they will play, be that bridge, because like you said, it's a huge investment of time and resource, which is largely unfunded for forming those collaborations. So we've, we've got funding to get that going through UK research and innovation, but those are you know, location specific or, or population specific. They're not gonna be available to everybody, but what we're hoping is that we can also as part of that advocate for exactly what you're talking about. We really need that kind of coordination role. That shouldn't be the responsibility of freelancers, small community organizations that simply don't have the resource to do that. We're also seeing examples um, of local authorities investing in those sorts of roles. I think recognizing that if we really want to um, have the best kinds of collaborations with community organizations, freelancers, is that you've got to put resource into supporting that kind of coordination and collaboration. So I hope that certainly our research and other research can help drive that kind of recognition that that's where you need to make the investment. You can't be expecting individual freelancers and small community grassroots organizations that have to be and want to be focused on the delivery. They want to be focused on supporting their communities that they're working in. They shouldn't have to be constantly applying for competing for these small bits of short-term funding. Changing that funding model, I think, has got to be the way forward. Absolutely. And, and on a program I worked in in Wales, we, we trialed some of that, you know, how you can bring in and compensate artists from the very beginning of some of these com conversations and not just compensate them to go in and facilitate an art session, but to just be part of the conversation and form some of those links and some of those partnerships. Um, and some of the research that we did there is now translating into the Arts Council of Wales thinking differently, for example, about how they fund arts and health and, and thinking, oh, you know, we need to invest more development funding into this so that gives and give people more time you know, because time is very important as well, isn't it? An important commodity, as as important as money sometimes. Um, but yes, I've got I mean, another question. Brilliant. We'd love to hear more about that. Tell us more. Share it with <laughs> us, Rosie. I will. I will. Um, and I'll, I'll put some links actually in the chat to the programme that I'm referring to, which which was kind of around um, exploring the different stages that arts and health projects go through and, and the support that they need at each of those. And that, and that there's a very defined beginning stage where those partnerships need to be formed and, and people need to build that understanding, not just of the health challenge that they're tackling, but of how each other works and what each other's priorities are. And um, so that they can really form those solid partnerships and collaborations. Um, what's your take on all this, Karen, listening to us speak here about these collaborations and partnerships? Uh, that reminds me of an experience where um, I was working on a grant uh, application and um, but then I realized that um, as an academic researcher uh, we often don't oh sorry well so the grant application is about how to improve children's engagement in the arts 
And as an academic researcher, I think sometimes that we ignore a lot of things that um, a lot of practical challenges that we tend to um, we tend to overlook. And so um, and so in this proposal, in this project, I then um, set up a advisory group, um, advisory board um, to invite um, people uh, from from the art sectors to really to discuss about um, the immediate research focus that they think uh, we should really focus on first. Um, and then we have this like very rich conversation where we're trying to um, discuss about how to lay out and structure the proposal and and what sort of questions that we should put forward and ask. And I just realized that I learned much more from them because they are the people who are directly working with children and young people. So they know a lot of practical challenges and opportunities that we might overlook from research. And so I think as, as Helen suggested that a collaborative um, model of research and funding would be a very good way to go to. Um, I also feel like, um, I know it may be quite overwhelming for arts uh, practitioners and freelancers to to kind of, um, to solve like big issues and health crisis. But I also feel that um, a lot of the things that when we address some local issues, um, either um, improving engagement rates in the neighborhoods um, areas or encourage some uh, people to um, who have been traditionally excluded from the arts to engage in the arts can have a national impact. Um, and so I think they should feel empowered and they should feel valued um, of the work that they do. That's amazing. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, it's really good to reflect on the relationship between research and researchers and all of this as well. And, and it's an ecosystem, isn't it? Everybody's got different parts to play and those, those roles can flux and change. Um, but I think that's a great example you've shared there of where just taking some time to just listen to each other and listen to those different priorities and perspectives can have a really powerful impact on the way that a project, particularly a research project, com comes to be. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And the time is tracking on a bit. So I think we've got to the kind of Q&A. We're opening things up here to the floor. Um, so please do pop your questions in the chat. If you have any questions for Helen and Karen, um, then we would love to hear those. Um, I've probably got a couple more while, just whilst we wait for people to, to think of their questions and pop them in the chat. Um, something we haven't talked about much so far is the COVID-19 pandemic, which is obviously a huge health crisis that we've all lived through in quite a unique way over the last few years. Um, and I'm particularly interested in your reflections on the role of creativity in helping us get through that crisis. So what we know about it, either from a research perspective or just your own personal views on that. Um, so I'll throw that to you, Karen. Have you got any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, so it's quite interesting pandemic um, in a way that's how people's engagement behavior changed. So um, so at first, when, begin, when the pandemic started, um, a lot of the arts venues and events, museums, and a lot of pu creative public venues closed down. So then we thought that um, people's engagement would decrease. But then we also um, found that that's not entirely the case because people were um, singing from their balconies, they were drawing rainbows to support NHS doctors, um, and um, the sales of creative materials and art materials have surged because uh, parents have been ordering arts and creative materials to spend time with their children, to engage in the arts. And so it seems that when the situation environment changed, uh, people also adapt to it. And what our research also found, which is very interesting, is that some of the demographic groups who have been traditionally been excluded from engaging in the arts have also started to engage. So we found, for example, during Rainbows for NHS, um, there is no, um, that provides motivations for people from diverse backgrounds to engage in the arts. Um, we also found that um, while some of the people continue to engage more, including people with high education backgrounds, but for those with high income, actually there's no differences in terms of how much uh, they engage in the arts. And that might be something to do with the changing working models. 
And so what I think is interesting is that people's arts and cultural behaviors can be changed if opportunities um, are different or are given or provide a system. Uh, so that's one of the big intake that I have um, from the COVID-19 social study. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, it's a wealth of, of uh, learnings from that study about, about all the behavioral changes that people um, underwent because of the pandemic. But I'm, I'm also interested in the kind of politics around this, Helen. So do you feel like there's been a sort of, you know, shift in that in that conversation with with policymakers around the role of, of arts and creativity in helping our health and well-being, you know, that's come about because of COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think there has. I don't think at the minute it's it's really transitioning into an understanding of, of what that means in terms of policy changes. But I think the, the biggest thing was around the recognition that the creative sector mobilised super, super quickly. It showed how agile, with very limited time, very limited resources, uh, uh, with our own concerns about, you know, sudden lack of funding, reduction in funding, lots of funding for many organisations because projects couldn't continue. I think there is recognition, particularly from organisations like Department of Culture, Media Thought, DCMS, Art Council, Lottery, who really recognise that, hang on, this is something special. Um, I can put a link to a, a study that we did, in fact, with the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance and an organisation called Creative Lives and various other organisations that looked at people's experiences, both of um, activities that were going on that people had put on during the pandemic, arts and, and cultural and nature-based organisations, but also from those providers, those individuals who were providing that, how they'd responded and how they worked. And that ability to be so agile, apart from the health sector, I don't think there's many other sectors who could have been, who, who responded quite as creatively or rapidly um, as that sector. So I think that ability to be agile and be creative is, is really a benefit. I think on, on the downside, what it showed is that those individuals can do stuff again on really, really small budgets. Um, and that's what we've got to shift again. It's that, that idea that this, this is free or this is cheap. And we've got to kind of shift that narrative that it, this is not a cheap alternative to providing health prevention and intervention. It's about making services, resources, organisations, individuals that everyone has equal access. And that better than that, that actually there is um, more access for the people that need it most. So again, going back to that targeted approach, I think that the problem is that you mentioned that ecosystem, these are really complex ecosystems, aren't they? And, and therefore we need to change stuff at all of those levels. It's at the local grassroots level, it's through to then these regional more, for example, integrated care system level, and then these national conversations. And that's where we can all play a role. I think changing that, that conversation. Um, if we keep saying, we just need more funding to do what we want to do, we're not going to get more funding. But if we change that nar narrative into, we are the organisations who can tackle inequalities for you, you're not tackling it, but this is a way of doing things differently, then that we, we are starting to see a shift. Uh, and there's some great examples of that. And you can look at, at some of the work, for example, that has gone on in terms of the Creative Health Manchester strategy. Um, you know, we're starting to see shifts in the way that organisations, by working collaboratively in a different way, that can have in terms of funding. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree. It's a really difficult balance, isn't it? Because, you know, artists in the creative sector want to go to health and health leaders and say, you know, and display the best of what they do and display, you know, display the kind of excellence that they produce and, and the creativity that they show. And and how resourceful they are as well, you know, and, and all these things are true. And and yet, you know, it sometimes it's kind of like if you don't ask for that help and say, but we need your help to sustain this or embed it or whatever, and and actually this costs and this is costing us, then then that conversation doesn't start to shift. Um, but I and I also think, you know, there's a, there's sometimes a perception that arts and creativity is kind of over here, just can, just sort of contained over here and is sustaining itself. Um, and so great, that's just an asset that we can draw from. We don't need to worry about how that asset gets fed and maintained. You know, it can, it'll just, it'll just be there. Yeah. Um, and so something has to shift still for me, I think, in that, in that narrative. And, and I don't know if the legacy of, of the kind of COVID pandemic has really affected that kind of change, you know? Yeah, I agree. I think there's still some 
serious conversations that we need to have at multiple levels to, to tackle that. And we can see it, it happening, you know, where we see people, you know, everyone, we're, we're a big fan of Rob Webster. He's the CEO of the, of the West Yorkshire ICS Integrated Care Partnership. And when you've, when you've got advocates like that who really get it and then think about commissioning, funding, uh, collaborating differently, you can see real change happening. It, it doesn't mean that everybody instantly gets access to loads of stuff they didn't have before, but it is a change. And, and that's what you need is those leadership positions. Um, so I think that's the, the you know, and, and you guys at, at Cultural Health and Wellbeing Alliance do a brilliant job of that in terms of advocacy. Thank you, yes. Um, so just thinking back to the sort of research aspect of this, Karen, in your view, where does the research in this area need to go next? What does the future look like? Um, I think there are a couple of uh, research directions that we could um, take it forward. So the first one is, um, apart from just looking at within countries, uh, in, in engagement inequalities, we can also compare um, the across countries inequalities. Um, there's one study that actually we have very recently been working on is our creative hobbies amongst all the adults across 16 countries, including the UK, some of the European countries, China, Japan, and the US. And uh, in this study, we found that um, older adults who engage in the arts, uh, sorry, engage in creative hobbies um, are shown to have a, a reduction in depression and improvements in their happiness and life satisfaction. But what, what's very interesting about this research is that these benefits uh, can be shown in countries where hobbies engagement is not that popular. Um, so we, we look at how uh, the hobby engagement across the 16 countries, and we found that the health, mental health benefits of creative hobbies can also be found in countries with lower um, engagement levels. We also found that the benefits can be found in countries with lower world happiness index score and also countries with higher inequalities. And so this, again, highlights um, the fact that um, the, that's the evidence that the arts uh, the benefits of the arts may be universal. Um, so that's one, one direction that I think we should move forward um, to prepare, uh, to compare, and also to learn from other countries what works and what doesn't work. Um, and another set of the directions would be to, um, to really invest on the social prescribing schemes where we can connect the arts to people with poor health and well-being. And I think there are more research, there, there have been research that's been going on, particularly in our team, we've been looking at um, how we can encourage the uptake of the social prescribing schemes amongst children and young people. Um, and I know that Helen has also done a lot of work on social prescribing schemes and arts and prescriptions. And I think that um, it would be really nice to really invest on these uh, research areas and to look at how the arts can also provide an alternative um, health care that is, that, is, that is not involving medications and that might provide a, a, a more curative um, options for people to improve their well-being. Thanks, Karen. And what, what about you, Helen? What are you, as you move into this next phase of, of your funding programme, what would you love to learn from that? And what, what are you hoping it will tell us? Yeah, well, I guess there's two there's two aspects. I mean, one aspect is not really covered within the current program I'm working on, but I think is really, really important in terms of the next phases of research, because what we've got in terms of the evidence base is brilliant evidence around these short and medium term benefits and impacts of engagement. We've then got the brilliant sort of work that Karen and Daisy and their team and others do around these kind of population impacts. What we're missing is that longitudinal bit. Um, and that's the sorts of data that for clinical interventions and prevention programs comes from longitudinal studies, randomized control trials, et cetera. We're never gonna have the funding to do that. But I think if we could think about funding research and doing research differently, where we're having more sustained engagements with organizations that are building these long-term relationships with communities, we can get that sorts of longitudinal evidence. 
for those individual level impacts. And that's where I absolutely guarantee where we already can see from the small studies that are out there, that that's when we'll see not just those immediate benefits in terms of physical health, cognitive brain health, and all the psychological benefits and the social benefits, but we'll start seeing more of that kind of health prevention, those behavior changes, the lifestyle changes, supporting people through those really challenging times, including things like poverty, including things like sustainability and pro-environmental behaviors, linking to diet and exercise, because it takes a long time to embed that sort of new way of living. Doing you know, a six week art program on the prescription will have those short term benefits, but in terms of bringing about those longer term changes, we need that sustained engagement. And then I guess that links into then the ambitions that we have for the sorts of uh, program that we're running at UKRI. Um, that's where I think then those systems level changes really come into play, because if we can change that landscape of making those offers a sustained offer, so it's not just a one off, you get to go to a one off activity or a series of activities over a few weeks. Instead, you've got a regular offer that you are going to every single week and that you've got a provider who you know is going to be there month after month, year after year. That's when we will see those sorts of benefits. So that's what we'd like to do is research that that ecosystem change that can bring about that more sustained engagement with community organisations so that some of the organisations that are represented here today and those other community organisations, they know they've got funding for five brilliantly 10 years to deliver a programme to work with communities in that embedded way. That's where we're going to really see changes in health prevention intervention. And what I argue, and I feel like part of my job is as a programme director, is that that's why investment in those sorts of funding uh, opportunities, those sorts of models of commissioning are going to bring about the best changes in society to address inequalities. So throwing more money at the symptoms of disease is not going to sort our public health problem out. Engagement in arts and creativity and the natural environment is. Absolutely. And it's, it's joining up all those dots and, and closing those gaps so that we really know what that story is. Um, from from throughout all our lives and throughout all of our involvement with creativity as well. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to ask for some snappy answers on this last question. But there's a question in the chat from a, um, a freelance artist about how to kind of get started in some of this work. But I'd like, also like to, to broaden that out to say, you know, if you had one, what would your one piece of advice be to creative practitioners, either starting out or, or a bit more embedded in this field at this moment? You know, what would about perhaps how they can access and use research better or perhaps how they can engage for the first time with some of this work. You know, if you had, if you had one bit of advice for creative practitioners, what would it be, Karen? Oh, um, I was wondering whether a collaborative mode uh, would be a good way to start with. Um, and so it, in, a, in a way that when we're trying to look for funding, I think it's, it's quite important to be, um, to involve people from different, with different expertise and their different professional backgrounds, because then they can really provide new insights into the project that you would like to propose. Um, and so I would say the most important thing would be the collaborative with interdisciplinary people from across different sectors. Um, but I think Helen would have more insightful. No, I, com I completely agree with you, Karen. And I mean, the number one thing is if you're not a member of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, join. You might also have local uh, groups, uh, to have, re have regional representatives, so link up with them. But I totally agree with Karen. I think it's about linking up with others who have your sort of shared ambition. I don't think, Sarah, in terms of your age, you definitely shouldn't put that, 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 that won't put people off and you shouldn't let it put you off. But you know, there is this amazing network, you know, Chua have built up this amazing network of individuals and organisations across the country, and there are these local groups, and there will be other people out there who are in the same boat as you, but by working together, and they might not, you know, it might be sort of outside of um, arts and creativity, you know, there might be nature-based people, it might be um, a local community organisation that focuses on social welfare legal advice, but, you know, really thinking about that building that collaboration, as Karen said, and, and linking up with other uh, providers, individuals, artists, creatives, freelancers in your area. And for me, 
you don't have to invest huge amounts of time in that, what we would call it this kind of asset mapping, but that's what exactly what the purpose of Culture Health and Wellbeing Alliance is. And, and there will be folk out there local to you who, who will be able to connect you up. And um, that's the great thing about these sorts of uh, networks is that, you know, everyone has, has been in the same boat as you at the same point, and we're in the same boat, aren't we, Karen, in terms of research? We're always, you know, it, it's finding, finding the, the, the like-minded thinkers. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, Karen. And, and I agree with everything you just said. And it's good to end on that note, because I think it's a really positive thing to reflect on how far we really have come in this area, not just in terms of the scale and impact of this work, but in how much more collaborative, partnership led and networked it is as well. I know that all these things are going to lead to significant changes. And I want to thank you both, not just for your amazing contributions today, Helen and Karen, but for your amazing work generally in this area, which has done so much to take this work um, forward for all of us. So thank you so much. Um, thank you also to Victoria and the team at the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance for hosting and convening us today. And thank you also to you, all the audience, for attending and for listening and for sharing your thoughts. So thank you, everyone, and happy creativity and wellbeing week. <laughs>